Hello and welcome to part three of our cybersecurity webinar series with Black Bottle IT. We'd like to thank all of you who have attended the three webinars so far and for your continued interest in our webinars. Before we get started, I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. We will send out an email tomorrow which will have the recording, the slide deck, as well as SHRM or HRCI recertification codes. We'd also encourage you to complete Black Bottle IT's complimentary cybersecurity gap analysis. You'll be able to complete this by following the QR code at the end of the slide deck. And now I'd like to welcome John Hensberger, president of Black Bottle IT and Mark Young, CEO at MyHR Council. Great, well, th thanks, Dan. And uh, uh, John, you know, thanks for uh, the third time around here and, uh, and thanks for your Great partnership. Um, you know, well, well, it's relatively new. Um, I know you're working with us uh, from the legal side, and and uh, it's been really, uh, you know, informative as well as entertaining just to uh, get to know you and get to know um, uh, your company and just how important this is, and just I mean, literally how you know current all of these things are from a day-to-day -day standpoint. Um, I know from our you know, our legal standpoint. We're getting these questions daily, um, so it's becoming, um, you know, really a critical piece to uh, compliance, if you would, for uh, for the organizations. Um, you know, our first two uh, webinars were really on uh, policies and how sort of hacking, you know, uh, comes about and uh, the different things you need to, you know, have in place. And, um, you know, again, sort of assuming that you're going to get hacked, um, as most companies really should, what are the things that you have to have after the fact to limit your liability, uh, protect your company, et cetera? What we're going to do today is um, really pick John's brain on how do we make sure that we have, you know, third party vendors lined up. Um, that we've looked at them and uh, made sure you know the uh, they're you know know the latest and greatest things that uh, are going on you know the different types of hacking that comes up and um, you know how quickly they can respond etc because this is um, you don't have days and, and weeks to you know get through this you have minutes and, and maybe an hours um, in, during the day to, to really get at that so um, John, I'm going to pass it off to you just to talk about kind of tee that up in terms of what you guys do and, and how you work with clients to really look at, um, you know, your your vendors and uh, and who you have lined up to to help you through this difficult situation. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think there is a couple different things there. So one is that there is a um, you know like every company has uh, uh, has a list of. Uh, a um a um a um a list of uh, the vendors that they work with to uh facilitate the business right um and like so like that's a list of vendors that is important to make sure that uh companies are uh like vetting properly to make sure that they have their cybersecurity controls in place but then you also have your vendors that you need uh in case you have an event um and then like you need those vendors in place because you're not gonna be able to handle um you know uh like responding to a um you know to any kind of uh, incident without having you know like third parties to help you navigate through those waters so i think those are the two kind of columns of things that we're going to be uh, talking about today and then on the list of like vendors that are your partners that you're using to facilitate business i think um you know that's a critical area that i think lots of people maybe aren't really um uh, like identifying as risk, uh, but it definitely is because um, you know if you're using them to facilitate uh, like payroll or uh, benefits on your HR side or something of that nature. I mean, they have sensitive data that belongs to your um, to um, uh, that like um, uh, that that uh, belongs to your uh, employees. And um, and so they have to have their own uh, cyber controls in place because they're basically us, um, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 like because if they have an event, well then, yeah, you, know, you know, I don't think anybody really cares that hey, it was our third party that had the incident. I mean, it's you know, like it's your responsibility as a company to vet those vendors and make sure 
that they have the proper uh, controls in place. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about, I think, on the next couple of slides here. But um, and like just to have a process for that, because, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be complicated um, and it doesn't have to be this overarching thing and a lot of time. But you do have to ask uh, questions of your vendors to just make sure that they have the right controls in place. And if they don't, then, well, then that's kind of when the work begins. You have to start vetting them a little harder to understand, well, why don't you? And maybe they have other controls in place that are the same thing, but, you know, but there are some things that you would have to dig in further if they answer no to some of those questions. So, Sure. Yeah, we, we hear a lot from clients, well, I have insurance, and uh, so that's fine. That'll take care of it. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll talk today about what, you know, the insurance, again, like we talked about, last time is that's great after the fact when you're you have damages maybe you have you know vendor expenses that you you had um had to use uh, you know to get through the hacking and the loss of data and replacing that data and marketing you know how you're fixing things etc um the other thing i hear a lot and uh, you know we have you know tens of thousands of clients who you know, small, medium-sized businesses, I talk to their business owners and I say, well, who, you know, who do you use to look over your vendor contracts, you know, and uh, whether, it, like you said, it's benefits, it's all this, you know, um, really confidential data. And they say, well, I look it over, I've become a, you know, a lawyer. And I said, well, you know, how much redlining do you do and everything? He goes, well, I don't, I don't redline anything. I just sign it. I mean, they're not going to change it. And, you know, while that could be true with Microsoft and such, you know, you have a click wrap and a lot of times you, you just kind of, um, you know, you just sign and, and you move on. Um, at the very least, make sure you know what you have. Um, there, most companies start with a limitation of liability, which is usually equal to what you pay the vendor on a per year basis. So if you think about, you know, maybe payroll, you pay a couple hundred bucks um, a month in, or, you know, $1,000, $2,000 a year, that's your liability limitation. And so I'll just use an example, um, Ultimate Kronos, who uh, was hacked back in uh, a year and a half ago. I think it took six to nine months to restore all of their data and a lot, a lot of um, very confidential data with benefits and social security numbers, et cetera. And, um, you know, their liability was limited to what you paid if you didn't go to the contract to what you paid on a given year, which is nowhere close to the amount of damage that that did to businesses. I, I know of many companies that were clients of ours, our clients of ours, that went through that and just even sending out marketing materials and the time that it took to have executives, et cetera, um, and salespeople call their their clients to say we're working on this stuff um, was well in excess of tens of thousands of dollars. And um, maybe your insurance covers that, um, but again, the contract is really important to look at to see, you know, not only what do you have, the kind of people you have um, agreed to bring on, but um, what their agreement says in terms of what they're going to cover. Yeah, and I'll you know I'll just camp on to the uh, contract. Is that I mean even if you have vendors, so like in the IT space, you know like you know like let's say let um, uh, like let's say you have somebody who is uh, backing up your data up to the cloud, and let's say you're a big business and you have a lot of data up there, right? Well, there is provisions in those contracts that say well they're only you know like they're only uh, um, uh, uh, they're only uh, obligated to restore at a certain rate, right? Which, which right. you know, if you have lots of data, might take you like a month to restore, for, ex for like, for example, if you have like a ransomware attack. So, you know, to your point, you know, I mean, like going into those contracts and looking at those details from those vendors and going, well, wait a minute, I can't be out of business a month while you restore. Like I need you to restore faster than this typical contract would allow for. I mean, I mean, that's a really good point, so. Yeah. So I think with that, we have um, our first polling question, and uh, we'll give everyone a, um, a couple of seconds here. But do you have a process for vetting your partners and vendors?
So this is this is this was a good test to see how GoToMeeting uh, worked. <laughs> fifty fifty. So you know, roughly roughly ten on each side uh, for the um, the attendees and that uh, in terms of the process. Um, and you know, again, some some will have a lot of times will depend on size. Some will have you know a very detailed um, vetting process for all of IT. Um, some will you know maybe say, yeah, I you know I vet them. I I review the the contracts, or I've had you know um, John's organization come in and take a look at uh, what we have in place and um, you know the different controls and that. So why don't we uh, why don't we go into that, John, in terms of sort of your risk risk assessment? And uh, I can guarantee you, um, my HR counsel is going to go through that risk assessment that uh, you're so <laughs> generous to uh, to let us uh, all have. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and on the slide, I mean, you can see our six things on there that are like the big hitters on any kind of on any kind of uh, third party that you would try to vet. I mean, you know, the password protection and the MFA is. Um, you know, is like the biggest one there. And if you're using software from a vendor, for example, um, and, um, you know, like, and they don't have MFA as part of their software as in, um, I mean, like they should, I mean, like everybody should have that option and it should be like auto turned on for everybody. It's not, I mean, that's not industry standard, but you know, this is like a soapbox thing for me is like, it should be turned on by default, just turn it on. Right. And I know it's a pain and I know everybody hates it, but it's necessary and everybody just needs to do it. And it shouldn't be like an opt in thing. It should be like an opt out, like never thing. Right. <laughs> so, so, um, so, um, uh, you know, like, so like, that's one of the questions that we always advise to ask if you're using somebody to process, uh, um, you know, like information from you, like payroll, for example, is a big one, right? There are payroll vendors that process out there. Um, and like everybody who processes payroll on your behalf should have some MFA, uh, uh, you know, like on their software for you to access. Um, uh, two is like the backup should be uh, segregated outside of your environment so that way if you get attacked and there's a ransomware that you can restore and kind of what I was saying about the cloud backup solutions is like they're great and they're easy to use to, um, however you know they do have their own uh, um, uh, their own uh, the nuance in that you know you have to make sure that you can restore them to a point so that you can be up and running quickly and you can restore them in the time frame that you want and like those aren't always part of a contract or part of a solution so um so like those are things that that we typically advise on, on how to dig into to make sure that you can restore quickly uh three is like the monitoring um is a uh like requirement these days with most uh, like, uh um you know with almost everybody in that you need somebody who has expertise in cybersecurity to look at uh, like alerts that come from some sort of tool that is monitoring your environment and then to be able to ascertain whether those alerts are uh, credible or not and if they are well then how to react to them in the short term and then and, and um, because like that like time of when you identify event to like responding um, like that's the critical time whenever you're having any sort of uh, cyber uh, like event and in our experience you know there's lots of events that come up and they're and they're just innocuous and they're not an event right so like so um, and like there's a lot of noise that goes on inside of a network or inside of an environment that you need somebody to be able to ascertain like what is the noise and then what is like the real stuff that I need to um, uh, like act on uh, uh, with the fourth one I, there is let me uh, jump in on that one yeah, John just, yeah. just a quick second um, you know, that's the that's the one where, again, I think uh, really critical to have somebody like John's team, which is, you know, you get a security alert. Um, we've had a case where, uh, you know, somebody clicked on, you know, one of the phishing uh, emails, you know, by accident. And, you know, here comes the ransomware. It looks like it's legit. Um, again, you and your team, as well as the insurance companies, know who's kind of legit, um, and then they're able to quickly assess what, how far did they get? You know, did they did they really get through your firewall and and that kind of thing? Because, you know, I always think of what what would happen if my you know if our top ten clients, um, you know, I had to call them and say, 
you know, your data was, uh, was hacked and, you know, somebody has it. Um, you know, like you say at the bottom, 20 years to build a reputation, five minutes for it to, to, you know, to ruin it. I mean, that would happen. If you lost your top five clients, every one of us on, on the webinar would um, go into a panic. And so, you know, again, with a security alert, it's now what do we do versus let's get a hold of the top five or 10 clients immediately because you don't know for sure right off the bat, did they actually get through um, your, you know, password protected and, and multifunction, you know, um, uh, protection and really get the client's data. So um, it's, it's one of those scary, let's alert everyone to it, but also let's get, you know, let's make sure that we're informed before, um, you know, we post the, to the 25,000 clients that, uh, yeah, all your data's gone, correct? Yeah, 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 uh, correct. Well, like, and if you fast forward on the list down to number six there, I mean, that's part of that incident response plan that says that, you know, you know, like if you have good uh, data that you think you're having an event, and even if you're, you know, 51% sure that something's going on, well, then that's when you trigger that plan that um, everybody should be aware of their role in, in like, in that plan. And, like, um, um, and, like, so to gather all of the folks in your organization and to, uh, understand, you know, like what is the potential event? Like, what do we know? Uh, like, what is the scope of it as of, you know, as of the time that you're meeting? And then to create that uh, communication between all of the players in your organization, and then to determine, you know, like what do we tell outside clients? What do we tell vendors? What do we like? Because all of that communication plan is part of that incident response plan, um, and uh, and uh, so like. You know that is like you know, but that's a critical, critical thing to be able to, um, you know, like make sure that like you know, like whatever the messaging is that goes out to the world is in line with like what's happening and then what the company wants to say. Because at the time you have an incident, and if it's unknown what it's the scope and what's the impact, you you don't know enough to have it this like unequivocal thing to say like this is what happened because you don't know that up front like i mean like you know i mean someday maybe a week a month from you know from then you'll know but at the time that you, you know like that you're you know like that you're having an event like you don't know and so you don't want to cause panic to your customers you don't want to create um you know like you don't want to say anything that may cause you uh like liability later because it may not be true so you don't want to say too much either because that's also can create a liability for you later um, so like there is a lot of um, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, nuance to like making sure that like those like initial uh, communications go out uh, like properly. So that's a big one. Um, you know, I mean, like we do a test of those plans too for uh, clients where we'll sit around a table and we'll just we'll just uh, simulate events and say, okay, so uh, you know, like ransomware hit the building go like you know who does what and then typically when you do it for the first time well everybody kind of looks around at the table going i don't know who do i call right um and like so that's typical for the first time that you're going to test the plan but then after you do it once or twice and everybody kind of understands their role and then they kind of know what to do so but it's an important thing to test the plan at least once a year is what we recommend so yeah and i'll and just add to that well yeah go ahead. i think if we if if you know one of the things that we have found is uh, cyber insurance over the last two years has probably tripled. Um, I think it, when I looked at uh, what we were paying versus, you know, right before the pandemic and, and kind of what we did to, um, you know, through our, I think it's a October one renewal and what's coming, um, there is negotiations that go into that and make sure that, uh, you know, your broker knows that you have an incident response plan, that you have, you know, uh, hopefully both of our companies um, as a backup to what happens and you know there are negotiations uh, it's not just picking a different insurance company or a higher deductible but um, we know there's hundreds of questions that go into the cyber um, you know um, questionnaire um, but you should also you know make sure that your broker is fully aware that you have a professional plan in place uh, that has been tested because they can negotiate with the insurance companies. Well, like, and also just to, to, like, I'll just, you know, sidetrack on the insurance real quick is, you know, like one of the biggest questions we get about the cyber insurance is well, like, when do I tell them I have a claim, right? So like if I have an event and it's kind of, 
uh, contained inside our walls and it doesn't have any customer impact, it doesn't have any uh, damage to our organization, do I still have to report that as a claim? And like the answer is yes, you do. Not because you want you know like damages from the insurance company, but if you don't report it and then something happens as a result of that incident later down the line, well then you're out of like the reporting timeline and then they won't cover anything that happened as a like result of that event if you don't notify them. I mean, you know, like, I mean, even if it's just like, hey, like we had an event, here's how we responded, it's all contained, we don't have any damages, I'm just telling you that it happened, well then that is good enough for the insurance company to say, okay, well then you notified us, that's good. So anything that would happen after that, well then would be subject to a claim after that. That's one of the biggest questions we get. Yeah. So. Great. So. All right, so uh, poll, polling question number two, have you ever gone through uh, a cyber risk assessment? I love the I don't know. Nice. No, good. That's good. The answer is yes. That's good. Yeah, yeah that's so good. only a handful that that haven't. And uh, you know, again, I think is over the years I've seen the, um, you know, the the questionnaire uh, or questionnaires uh, plural it become very long and and uh, I think I've even spoken with the insurance company as to our cyber uh, response and that because obviously with attorney-client privilege data uh, it's a big deal and uh, you know it, for those of you that uh, are using the portal it, you know that uh, you know really critical information that needs to be segregated and protected um, you know is really important so um, John, why why a cyber risk assessment? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, so I mean, we do these like all the time, and um, and it's more just to identify gaps in any kind of side, you know, um, so gaps. I mean, like everybody's gonna have like probably a gap, and maybe it's a small one, a medium one, a large one, but somebody's gonna have a gap, and like there's always room to improve there, right? It's not like hey, I have everything done, and I don't have anything else to do. I mean, this is a constant, you know, like evolving. Thing because there's better tools, there's more tools, there's different attack uh, like vectors that uh, you know what that the bad guys are you know like exploiting, and so like it's this ever evolving thing. So just because you've done it doesn't mean that you can't do it again. Um, and um, and uh, you know like we're looking at it from you know like sometimes we'll do like a high level one and sometimes we'll do a granular one. Um, and I think that it kind of gives the, um, you know, like it gives the organization a kind of a good lens as to like where our risk is. And that's where we're looking. We're looking at where's your data at, um, you know, like who has access to the data and then basically how is that data, uh, like protected. Um, and then, and then we kind of go from there. So, I mean, we're looking, you know, like we're not looking at necessarily like, you know, like what kind of IT tools do you have? I mean, we're looking at data and risk to the organization first and foremost. Um, and uh, so like, that's how we're looking at it. And then we advise on risk and then we identify gaps and then we offer you know, like solutions for that, whether it's us or whether it's other third parties have, you know, solutions also. And so we're advising them on risk. And I think it's a really good opportunity for organizations to look inward at themselves to say, okay, like, you know what, this is the risk to our organization if we don't do something um, in all the gaps. And like a lot of the gaps that we find, I mean, like most of them are with maybe, you know, having, you know, having that security talent in-house is a big gap we see. I mean, you know, like not everybody has a security staff in-house that can do the things that are needed. And like, so outsourcing that to somebody else like us, um, you know, like is a big one that we find um, because it means, you know, because like, a lot of companies have tools. They say, hey, I have tools and they show me like data that says, hey, I have a potential um, uh, event, right? But then, you know, but then they don't have anybody in-house to look at it to say it's credible or not and then what to do about it after. 
So, um, you know, that's one big gap that we normally see. Um, you know, like the second big gap we normally see uh, is like the incident response plan. Um, you know, I mean, like people may have one on paper because I got a template from the internet and that checks the box for insurance or like maybe a sock audit or something like that. But I don't think that any, but uh, like, but like a lot of companies haven't uh, tested the plan. So that's a big gap is that they don't gather around the table and they don't test the plan at least once a year. So I think that is a, you know, um, uh, that's a gap. And then like the third thing is uh, insurance is a gap too, because because there are companies that think they have cyber insurance as maybe part of a GL policy and they might, and it's probably like this big and it doesn't, it, well, like, and it wouldn't cover an event. Um, and so, you know, like that's a big gap. And then uh, finally, uh, we also find that when you do have an incident and most people don't have, uh, don't have uh, like vendors lined up to help them respond to that event. So like they don't have a legal, they don't have any kind of uh, like forensics lined up, like in case I have an event, then I call you and you're the person who's going to help me navigate those waters as part of an incident response. So those are the big four that we typically see in some degree or fashion. Um, and then there's other ones in there sprinkled in too, but that, you know, but those are the big ones. All right. So the tips to prevent cyber attacks, this is critical. <laughs> Um, think before you click. So that's, you know, I mean, that's everybody's getting, you know, pummeled with, you know, like, look at the email, don't click on anything bad, don't open things from people you don't know. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest thing that uh, we try to enforce. And I think employees of organizations are aware, and I think they're getting pummeled with, you know, like that message from all sorts of fronts. So, um, so no. I, like, if you're not getting pummeled with it, well, then you should be. I'll say that, right? So. <laughs> Uh, MFA and strong passwords. I think that everything that you have access to, email, third-party software, uh, like whatever you have access to, you should have MFA to some degree on it. And if you don't have MFA, well, then you need to turn it on after this call. And uh, well, like, and if your software solution does not have that, well, then you know, like, well, then you need to, you know, like, get on the phone with them and figure out where it is on the roadmap, or B, you might want to find another vendor, because, like, that is going to be, like, so that is a requirement going forward. Everybody should have it, and I can't stress enough how much uh, passwords are just not enough anymore. I mean, they can be cracked, and, like, and, like, they will be cracked, and if you don't have MFA, then at some point, like, you know, I mean, like, that account is going to get compromised. Yeah. Um, update software and segregate backup. So this is a, this is an easy easy thing to say, hard to do. So you know, I mean, like update your software, uh, like patch, you know, like patch, patch, patch. You know, like when there's like a security update, make sure that your IT staff has a schedule for that. Uh, typically, you know, like Microsoft has their patches come out on Tuesday. It's called Patch Tuesday, um, and like so, sometime after Tuesday, well, then your IT staff should be applying those patches to your Windows machines. If you have uh, software by a vendor, then they should be having um, like updates if it's like an on-premise solution um, to uh, you know to like apply to always be uh, current with those software patches um, because I mean we see like the um, exchange um, uh, like vulnerability for uh, you know for like people that were running uh, the on-premise exchange for email there was a vulnerability that like affected you know thousands of businesses because they were running an old version of exchange and there was a exploit there and like you know like and like people were able to get into email servers for a long time so like that's just one example in the recent past uh backups we kind of talked about about making sure those backups are off-site or they're in some kind of cloud-based solution and they're outside of your network and then um yeah and like then just to make sure that when you have a backup that you have a plan about how to restore and how long that's going to take yeah, and if you think about just even like uh, payroll, um, you know, if you've done payroll before and you're, let's say you have 50 employees or 25 employees, I mean, how many payroll periods do you want to have to redo, um, mm -hmm. you know, or put into a system? And again, that was, um, we, I was helping a, another company out, I was on their board and and they had Ultimate Kronos and, uh, you know, they had uh, several hundred employees and they had to do two payroll period 
backups and it was you know doing doing it by hand uh, multi-state etc took them weeks to bring that back up um, so while it seems like a lot of work um, you know just make sure that you think about you know if I had to back this up or I, you know when I have to take over how many weeks and months do I want to um, have to fill in data that I have somewhere else uh, to bring that up to date yep well, that's a good point well, and then the last thing that I talked about is, I mean, like having a plan for like when you have an incident, um, I can't stress how important that is because, it, because you know, like if you have an incident or like when you have an incident, probably is the right word now, um, is that, you know, you need to understand, you know, how are you going to respond? How are you going to communicate to your clients? How are you going to communicate to your vendors? And then how are you going to recover from it once you understand scope? And I think that is like, the you know, that's really important. Um, it's like, uh, you know, like it's like doing like a fire drill, uh, you know, I mean, there's a fire in the building. What do you do? Well, you know, I mean, people do fire drills all the time to know, Hey, like, these are my exit doors. These are where I gather in case there's a fire. It's the same exact concept. You need to practice the plan and like everybody has to be aware of their role. Like when you have an incident, because the timing of like when the incident happens to when you respond to how you'll to, you know, how all of that, uh, communication goes out to clients and vendors is critically important in like the early stages of an incident so very good we've got one question so far okay uh, and the question is is there a checklist audit that you have on pdf or other format that can be provided to us um, and then in parentheses they had cyber risk assessments yeah yeah i mean um so yeah i mean i can uh provide the checklist um and i can do that or if you scan the qr code uh i think it takes you i don't know if it takes you to the full form or not i don't think it does so i will send you i will send you like the checklist to do the cyber risk assessment yeah i just strongly urge everyone to take the assessments um it's kind of the great to have again the the checklist you know for the future and stuff but uh do make sure you take advantage of uh, John's generosity there. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, and like we're offering just to you know go through the checklist and you like once you fill it out, well then we'll advise on gaps and how to fill them, and then you can take that information and fill them however you choose to, and we'll give you, you know, like gap filler uh, like recommendations on um, you know what depending upon your situation and like how you're doing your IT and who your staffing is, we can give you kind of recommendations on how to do all that. Great. Okay. Well, John, it's uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I hope we can do uh, you know further further discussions and webinars as to uh, all the great things that uh, we have in place so that it doesn't happen, that hacking doesn't. But it's you know all we hear about now is AI and all the things that are coming out. And like you said, um, the amount of data, how quickly you can um, run data analysis, et cetera, to get a password, um, you know, to hack into organizations. You know, we talked about on the first uh, the first webinar, you know, one of the, um, probably the highest incident rate is when uh, employees use their home emails and they send stuff to home uh, to work on things after hours, which just seems, you know, great. Um, but if they're not, you know, on the system and they're not, uh, you know, behind the firewall of the organization that, you know, again, you've put into place, uh, it's very easy to uh, get Gmail and Comcast, et cetera. So, um, you know, again, having that remote, you know, uh, IT systems, you know, personal use um, policy in place is, is just really critical because, um, again, you pay, you know, uh, money to have the, the back, the, you know, the backups and the protection um, and going, you know, working around that and in turning off the MFAs or using personal, you know, email on your phones, et cetera, is just a way to, um, you know, sort of blow the money that you uh, put into place to have that security there. So, um, again, with that, it's a QR code. Um, take advantage of this. And, John, thank you very much.
No, uh, thank you, Mark, for the opportunity to present. And I uh, had a good time over these last three, and I hope we can, uh, you know, do more together. I enjoyed it. So thank Sounds you. Sounds great. All okay. right, everyone have a great day, and thanks so much for attending.